establishing that fact, let's look at the prophetic statements with church and tribulation. You ready? Ephesus. Here we go. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, so God wants John to write to this angel of the church of Ephesus. Now remember, this is verse by verse study. So a lot of you who don't understand how to read the Bible, this is your only chance to understand. So while I'm explaining a passage, I want you to pay attention and see how I explained it. That way, if you keep doing this, then when you do your own Bible reading, it's going to click more, okay? Plus, you don't know if I'm going to teach you heresy, so you better be looking, okay? And see, and pay attention to how I explain it to you, verse by verse. All right, here we go. So what is John writing to this representation, appearance of these people at Ephesus? Here we go. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. All right, remember at chapter one, Jesus was holding seven stars in his right hand. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Okay, so remember, Jesus in the, is the one at chapter one, walking in the middle of the seven golden candlesticks. So Jesus is walking among churches and he's checking you out. Okay, now anyways, verse two, I know thy works. So Jesus knows the works of these people at Ephesus and thy labor. Okay, so that's a little bit different from works. You might say, how so? Labor sounds like labor, like uh, as if, you know, we talk about, you know, a woman in labor, and labor comes out of sweat. So it is work and effort, but it is out of pain and sweat. So this is a little bit different from works right here. Okay, and thy patience. Okay, that's very plain then. There's a breaking, suffering, sweat going along here. So now there's patience. You're putting up with it. Now that should be our church. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Ah, this one you want to keep in mind. Notice this church is commended for its not tolerance, but intolerance. What's the matter, you liberal, uh, you tolerant liberals? Do I hear an amen on this one? This church is commended on its intolerance, amen. Here's the thing is that we live in a day and age, especially this liberal area, we're tolerating a bunch of garbage. This church is commended for intolerance. Well, why? Why is that? Because it distinguishes what's evil and wrong and what's good. When you keep tolerating, the lines are so blurred you can't tell anymore. Right. Now let's keep reading here. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. So notice that God says, you were testing out these people who claim to be apostles and are what? Not, they're not apostles. And hast found them what? Liars. Liars. Ah, this is good. All right. You charismatics are going to get mad at me for saying this. Ready? Watch. They're, they're speaking in tongues right now, rolling around the ground, getting upset at me now. Okay. What? Okay. Now, look. A bunch of you charismatics watching us online, I love you in the Lord. I'm glad our ministry is a blessing to you. But I'm sorry. You're wrong. And you got to repent of this wicked doctrine. It is a wicked doctrine. So the thing about... Notice this church is commended for criticizing these charismatics. So I got to be that kind of a church as well. Now, in this church age right here, see, prophetic timeline. How many of you have heard of church fathers before, right? So church fathers, these were early Christians who were before the Protestant Reformation and before the other breakup groups like the Vaudois, Waldensians, Cathari, Montanists, etc., etc., so these guys, church fathers, were like the early Christians. This is important to understand. Church fathers were responsible for Catholic teaching today. But you got to realize this. Church fathers were, are not bad people originally. You might say, why is that? Because they were literally the fathers of the church that time. Well, why do we put them as a negative connotation then, Pastor? It's very simple. The reason why is because... These people started out as good, but then what they did is that they started to, in their own study, in their own study, they inserted some of their own teaching. Now, don't you see that with good, genuine, Christian, saved pastors today? And I'm not talking about lost. I'm talking about saved, genuine pastors. See, it starts out with slipping in a little error, 
And trust me, if you give it a thousand years, you don't think you're going to end up like a Catholic church? Yes, you will with that much time. So during this time of the church fathers, this early era, it is what we call the apostolic fathers. That's the timeline of the church of Ephesus that you want to know. Apostolic fathers. Why? Because they were from the apostles. A famous example is Polycarp. He was trained by the Apostle John. That's why the Catholic Church, they rarely use his sources for their teachings because he was directly trained by John. But Polycarp, he, there is no doubt he had a few errors too. Notice apostasy was current in John's timeline here. If you don't believe that there is a corruption of doctrine, even while the apostles were alive that time, then you're dead wrong. Well, these church fathers were directly trained by the apostles, though they can't be wrong. No. How many people did I get from this church who taught wrong things, even though they attended my church? See, you're going to get wackos coming out in your current timeline. Just because you're trained by the uh, apostle doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean a lick. There was apostasy. If you read every epistle of the apostles, there was apostasy in their timeline. No wonder it ended up like the Catholic Church when you give it a thousand years. Now, this is important to know against charismatic doctrine. These were called apostolic fathers because they were in the time of the apostles. But look at this. It says you try them that are apostles and are not found them liars. They were testing out apostles. And guess what? They failed the test and thus they are not apostles. What does that mean? That means then there were no genuine apostles that time. What does that mean? Your signs and wonders were definitely fading away to the point of extinction. Amen. They don't like to hear that. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, ah, okay. Where do you find your record of the miracles of the church? Acts, the book of Acts, right? But what's it called? Acts of the what? Apostles. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. Who had the miracles? It's be the apostles. It's not saved believers, Christians. It's the apostles who had the signs and wonders. Well, there were some Christians who participated in signs and wonders. Yeah, you know why? Because of the apostles there. Because of the apostles there. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now look at this. Verse 11, truly the signs of a Christian? Truly the signs of a believer? No, truly the signs of a what? Apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Look at that. The only reason why Christians and churches participated in this, if you read the next verse, is because of the apostles. If it says signs of an apostle, what does that mean? Signs belong to an apostle. If, if I say the car of Gene Kim, no, don't say it's your car, my friend. That's my car. Amen. All right? That's what charismatics are doing. My signs, my signs. No, it's the apostle signs. How many of you heard them quote Mark 16? Mark 16. The signs and wonders, signs and wonders, signs and wonders. You know what the easy debunking to that is? Who is he speaking to? The 11 apostles. Don't believe me? Look at five verses behind it at Mark 16. He's, he says, and he said unto the eleven, blah, blah, blah. Because the apostles were the ones who had these signs and wonders. Now, if you really get mad at me and say, no, 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 then this is what we need to do. This is the church of Ephesus. You ready? To disprove this apostolic false apostles, we have to be doing what Ephesus is doing. And they had this bad at their timeline. So we got to follow their example because it's bad now. Benny Hinn, please go to this hospital and cure everybody over there with cancer. That's right. Oh, no, don't do that. Why? You, you can't tempt the Lord. Tempt the Lord, my foot. You, okay, the Bible says we're supposed to test you, tempt you. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to try you out. Uh, imagine this guy, I forgot his name, uh, Kilpatrick or something like that. But he had a Brownsville revival, claimed to do all these miracles, and this farmer wanted his son to be resurrected from the dead, so he brought his deceased son right in front of 
Kilpatrick, I think, that guy. And he said, will you please, and he was in tears, please resurrect my son. Didn't the Bible said the apostles raised these people from the dead? And you know what that wicked preacher said? Oh, no, that resurrection was only spiritual. What, what in the world, man? No, the apostles did genuine, literal, real healing. By the way, if you're going to cure and heal somebody, it is instant on the spot, not gradual. So if you think you got healed, a lot of it can be very psychological. And trust me, uh, they, there are real scientific studies about the placebo effect, and it's real and genuine. That's why they, you ever wonder why they put that faith card on you? Believe, 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 because that helps with the placebo effect where you believe where you healed or this thing actually healed you, but it did nothing. That's a scientific, realistic state truth, actually. So this thing, we got to be doing it on you. All right, so notice that this verse is proof that this apostolic era is definitely gone. It's fading away.